Who does so? What the yeah, so they would like to have some protectionist Britain. policies, yes, mm -hmm. against. Uh, I don't think it's the budgets, right? the, the European budget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it covers most algorithms that you have seen in the course, otherwise, and many others. And he also presents a proof of some of these results. Um, there is also the original paper that I hope which is self contained and much short. You know, you find the proof of uh, the result. Um, right, so now we are going to see how we use this result to bound. The initial and the regression. We may consider the case in which we have a finite function class. So, first we consider the case, and the argument is similar to the previous case of classification, where we have only one function in the class. <coughs> so, in this case, our uh, variable is the loss, right? the loss of the new point. I call it uh, Xi. And uh, here you have the true mean, which is expected error, minus the empirical mean right, for the loss. Right? And we assume that the loss takes value in the interval 0, 1. Right? So this also covers classification. It also covers regression when uh, the loss function is bounded between 0 and 1. Okay. In general, this uh, result covers regression when the loss is bounded. Okay. So we are for simplicity we assume zero one. If it is unbounded, it will not it will not work, so different analysis is required. So often the point is for bounded So and the answer is kind of straightforward, right? So we, we apply the data quality. So we say that if you have only one function, the probability that uh, the difference between the true error and the empirical error being more than epsilon is less or equal than this quantity. Right? So this is exactly the inequality. Right? Okay, so we, we use this one, right? The true mean, the true error, less empirical, is less or equal than the exponential of 2m epsilon squared divided by 1. That's what I used here. And then again, you obtain a confident bound, right? So you get, you set, you set this equal to delta, and you solve for delta. Sorry, you solve for epsilon. Right? And then you conclude that uh, about uh, right, sorry. The true error is close to the empirical error. How close it is depends on this quantity. So this is more the larger the sample size, it's more than the deviation. So this also you call uh, the difference between the two, you also call the deviation. Right? <coughs> the deviation goes to zero as n goes to infinity. That's what we know. So now, how do you do this for more than one function? Like before, we use the union model. And we, and we get the bound where the size n, capital N, appears. So, Right. 
So we want to get the bound for uh, the function which minimizes the empirical error. Right? So this is our learning algorithm. At the beginning, in the first lecture, we called uh, right, so it's our uh, A F of S. Right? We have our sample. We have a function class. Here is called capital H. Script F, here is called script H, but it's meant to be the same as a type. Uh, so our algorithm, given the sample by the function there, is a empirical randomization, so the solution of this problem. That's a function which minimizes over the possible functions the, the, the empirical error. Could have divided by m, but the result, empirical error is 1 over m. The result doesn't change. So the question that we want to answer, of course, is uh, we want to bound uh, the probability of, we want to bound the deviation between the error of our algorithm, of our function, and Empirical error, right? The empirical error will be small. The function class is large because our algorithm looks for the function which minimizes the empirical error. But what about uh, what about the true error? Right? Will it be close to the empirical? Will, will it be also will it also be small? Right? If this deviation is small with large probability, the answer is yes. This is what we want to do, so to quantify in which we want to say that with large probability, indeed, uh, the deviation will be uh, less than epsilon. Right? So for a small probability, uh, the deviation will be more than epsilon. So this is what we do by using of the new okay, So how do we do it? We just use the union bound. take S, so we take many events. So AN is uh, the event where the true error of FN minus the empirical error is greater or equal than epsilon, where epsilon is a parameter between 0 and 1. Um, so, so the union of the events, right? You can also write it as this event, right? The maximum over L, the deviation, is bigger than epsilon. Bigger than epsilon, right? So because this means that there is at least one N such that the difference is bigger than epsilon, right? Does it make sense? I see you puzzled. Maximum is greater than epsilon, there is at least uh, one of these events which happens. So, using the big bound, probability that uh, the maximum deviation between the true and the empirical error in the class is greater than equal than epsilon. Is less or equal than the sum of the probability, and each of these probability we are bounded by this quantity. Right? So we just get a factor of capital N. Right? So that's, we just use often the quality n times, and that's the that's answer. So the set is equal to delta of the four. So, and then we get this bound. So, 
conclusion is that Sample by Fs is the empirical error minimizer. Then the probability of this 1 minus delta, so the high probability, delta will be 0 0.01. 0 .01. Uh, the true error is less, so it is close to the empirical error, right? Because this quantity will be small. M is large enough. So M must be much bigger than the logarithm of the number of functions in the class. Okay. So the reason for which we obtain this bound is that we have these bounds, right? It's a uniform bound. Right? It holds for every function in the class. So in particular, it will hold for the empirical uh, for the algorithm. Right? So the algorithm finds one of the functions in the class, right? what we have called Fs. <coughs> so this is also called a uniform bound, also every function in the class. Since a priori we don't know which functions in the class will be selected by the algorithm, uh, that's the way to analyze the problem. Right? So we need a uniform bound. We can also show, we discussed this in the lecture, but that this is needed. Right? So this uniform bound is needed in order to in order for having a bound for the algorithm. Right? This is this last bound is what you are interested in. This is not what you are directly interested in. It's a tool which allows you to derive this conclusion. Right? But this tool, this condition is necessary. It's not only sufficient, but it's necessary. For drawing the conclusion. So the conclusion tells us that uh, confirm our, our common sense. Right? In order to avoid overfitting, M must be large, and how much large does it need to be? Well, in this worst case analysis, it needs to be much larger than uh, log of M. Right, so the delta would be 0 0.01, so the log of 100 is uh, 3.5. But log capital M would be like 1,000, 10,000. It can be big. Right? Uh, so the bound gives you a quantitative answer about how large the sample size needs to be in order for you to safely say that you are learning. Okay. So it's a, this is a very important conclusion. And as I was saying before to um, one of you, this is a worst case bound, right? So it holds for every uh, probability distribution for which you draw the data. Right? So there are only some mild assumptions. So the assumption is that apply often in the so you can assume the loss when evaluated on the function is between 0 and 1. So, um, so since it is a worst case result, so in practice it might not be very useful, right? Because in practice uh, you have the end, what we see, and can be infinite, countable function classes are infinitely countable. Even if you have finitely many models, maybe they can be really a lot. So this will tell you that n must be larger than, say, 1 million. Right? But maybe in some cases, the bound can be small also. <coughs> so this, this can be close to this also for smaller sample sizes. Okay, so this is a worst case analysis. But still, nevertheless, it's an important conclusion because it tells you in principle when you can avoid the fit when, 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 when you're So it's a very important piece of work, which tells you that uh, you know, under these conditions, the algorithm is not, is not an heuristic. Something is happening. And this is just the beginning, right? Then um, you, uh, as we now see, we can extend these to richer spaces. 
So this is another way to write the, the bound, so the cardinal of A is just the number of functions in the class, right? And, but you can also, uh, yeah, you can rewrite the bound in a different way. So you can write, before you write epsilon as a function of m, right? Now you can write m as a function of epsilon. And this is what is called the sample complexity bound. So this says that if you want the deviation between the empirical error and the true error to be less than epsilon, so epsilon will be, say, 0.01. 0 .0. Then the sample size, right, needs to be at least equal to this quantity in order for the deviation to be less than epsilon. Less than epsilon. This is just a different way to have to do to, uh, to uh, right. To, uh, Analyze the same equation. So this, this equation you can solve for epsilon, you can solve for m. Right? When you solve for epsilon, you get this conclusion. And when you solve for m, you get the sample complexity. And you get the so it's another way to answer the same question. So you see that the sample the size needs to be proportional to the logarithm. collection of these uh, function classes. Right? <coughs> In particular, it could be uh, this algorithm which is called structure risk minimization. They are nested. So I have, say, three functions in the first class. So it's a very small function class. And then I enrich it. So I put more and more functions. I get like a non-union. Right? Okay. But the last one is HQ. So which one should I choose? So if I fix function class, I have this bound. But can I, for example, optimize this bound? So for example, can I minimize this over Q? Right? That would be a way to uh, do model selection. I have many possible models. Which correspond to one function class. Which one do I choose? <coughs> one, one common sense approach is to minimize uh, the bounds. Right? This, this is what is called structural risk minimization, or structural error minimization. Right? <coughs> this is interesting because, uh, as you can see, if you mean since the, the classes are bigger and bigger, one after the other, so this quantity is a function of Q, right? So, so here you have Q, right? So as Q increases, the function class increases, so the complexity increases. Right? So the error goes down, the empirical error, right? It's a function of little Q goes down. But the bound, right, so this, this term uh, increases, right, because the number of elements of the class increases, so it increases. So if I minimize uh, the sum of error plus the bound, 
the deviation, I find the optimal trade-off between error and complexity. And well, there is something important to realize, though. It is very important, is that that the bound that I have minimized uh, holds for each fixed set of functions. Because it is obtained by applying often inequality right, through a union bound to all the functions in the class. But the class is fixed. Right? So now, if I uh, if I minimize this bound, right, and I find this Q star, right, so Q star is, is the optimal, in my model selection, is the optimal function class in this nested family of function classes. Then, if I want to say what is the difference between the error of the selected function, so I, I select my function class, and within it, I find the minimizer. Right? What is the difference between the error of the of overall, which is my learning algorithm? It chooses for a function class, and within the function class, minimize the error. So the deviation between the true error and the empirical error now is, is bigger. Right? So there is this log of Q. Right? And this is obtained. This is the price that you pay by choosing not only the best function within a class, but also choosing the best class. And this is obtained by doing a union bound over all these bounds. Okay. So if you think about it, this additional logarithm of Q is natural. This is a result of uh, playing with all these bounds all together. So this is called the uh, structure risk minimization. And Normally, this is done in the case in which you have continuous function classes. Right? Similar bounds are derived when, uh, so for example, H of Q is say Q with uh, linear regression, and you say that this is the set of functions such that uh, the weight, say, is less or equal. Constant time Q. Q goes from one to the Q. So the bound, the class of greatness, which is the radius, right, or maybe some R of Q, where R increases with R increases with Q. So similar bounds can be derived in a more complicated. And we don't discuss them. And what I'm going to discuss is the notion of the see dimension. So this is a little bit, this is an extension of the ideas to infinite sets. Are there any questions, by the way? <coughs> so here, just Words. This is very interesting, more technical. So, <coughs> in all these bounds that we have derived, uh, you see that there is the logarithm of the number of functions in the class. So, it, it is good because you have many functions in the class, but the <coughs> bound, the number of functions in the class only appear logarithmically. Right? And there is a reason for that. And the reason that the, the logarithm of the number of functions in the class is an upper bound to the VC dimension, which is what we now introduce. So what is a VC dimension? So it's a, it's a number associated to a set of functions right, to measure the complexity of the set of functions. And <coughs> Uh, it is best described in the case of classification, but it can also be used in the case of regression, but I'll discuss that. So we go back to classification. 
uh, there is a dimension of a set of classifiers. So I have a set of functions, each of which is a 0, 1 function. Is so this, this dimension is equal to h if h is the large largest number of points, right, of inputs that can be shuttered, can be separated in all possible ways to, to the power of h using functions in the class. Right? So, uh, <coughs> right? so dimension is three, if you can find three points, let's say that points are in the plane, such that in your functions you can do all the possible classifications, right, which are which are a to the power of three. This one, right? And the opposite, because you can say positive and negative and vice versa. Right? So you have two of these, then you have two of these and two of these, right? And then you have the function which puts all the points on one side, it's positive, and the opposite. Right? So there are eight in this case. So the dimension of this function class, I have example the function class is three. If you can find these points, three points, which you can separate in no possible ways, but you cannot find four points. So no matter where you put the four points, you cannot separate them in possible ways using functions in the class. So it is clear that if you have a function class which is finite, the which I mentioned is at most log n. Log 2 n, right? So h is less or equal to log n. Also the previous log n. This logo was in the natural so, um, But they are almost the same. So, um, so if I have a function, if I have a function class, this dimension is log n. But if it is an infinite function class, <coughs> log n is an infinite. But if this dimension can still be finite, so there are many function classes. Which consists of infinitely many countable or uncountable <coughs> functions, <coughs> which still have a bounded complexity, a boundless dimension. And uh, the most uh, common one is the set of uh, lines, <coughs> separating hyperplanes. So we can show that we see the dimension of linear classifiers is equal to n, so uh, d, let's say. If you have this much of class, h is equal to sine, right, of the of the x, of the zero one, x is going to be, right? and you see the dimension is equal to d. Is the number of parameters. So in this special case, this dimension is the number of parameters. It sounds a bit boring, right? But there are <coughs> cases in which it is much larger than the number of parameters. Okay. So for example, there is an interesting case is uh, so if you so let's see, if you take this much. So 
this is a countable class, right? And here, the dimension is infinite for the show. Okay. Even though the class only depends on one parameter. Anyway. So, um, so there is this notion. It is a combinatorial notion, right? Because you count all the possible dichotomies that you can So you, you look for the maximum number of points for which you can find all the possible dichotomies right, using functions in the class. Is it clear what this is? Is it clear what this dimension is? So it's one uh, of the important notions to measure complexity of functional classes. There are others, but that's the most important. Now, the reason for which it is important is that we can derive bounds similar to the previous one for the finite case, where now the this dimension appears inside. So this is right. Okay, so <coughs> this is uh, this is what you can say. So theorems like this. So I minimize my Empirical error over the function class fs is the solution, my very hungry. Then you can say that the deviation between so the true error is less or equal to the empirical error plus this deviation term. Right? Now the deviation term is not the logarithm of the number of functions in the class, but it is essentially the recent dimension up to logs. Right? So this, <coughs> these two, well, no, so you, can, you need to compare this bound to this one. They are very similar when the function class is finite. <coughs> you don't have the two. But this is the price that you have to pay to make a more general analysis. And also you, uh, you pay this log. Right? So the difference in the, in the bound is this term versus this term. So if you apply this bound to a finite function class, you can immediately say that the middle age is less or equal than the log of capital M. The bound is a bit worse. Right? It's worse because of this factor 2 here, and it's worse because of this log right? Except that it is essentially the same bound. Or it's also worse because of this. These are little leakers. Um, <clears throat> However, as I said, the bound can be better because the recent dimension can be smaller or much smaller or longer than the longer of the number of functions in the class. And this is kind of obvious because if the functions are all the same, the recent dimension is one, right? It's not like that. So, all right. Actually, I had this. <coughs> Let me just repeat what I said. Uh, <coughs> so, so if you have lines in the plane, and you also have an intercept, which the dimension is d plus one. to prove that, right? So to prove that if you take d plus one points, you can separate them unless they are in some degenerate position. But if you take d plus two, you cannot. And likewise, it's interesting to show that if you have maximum this is what you said before. your points in a certain position right, on the line such that you can find all possible dichotomies by playing with this parameter A. 
So this is a little bit different from what I was saying before. So A is a real number. So in this case, this dimension is different, which means that uh, you can be completely misled by using this function class. We always have the data, right? even though the true error might be much larger than zero. So in this case, we cannot learn using this function class. We need to restrict it. Yeah. 
up to the easy dimension if we want to use it as an indicator for overfitting or not overfitting. Yeah. It's still very easy to overfit on even sure. with the linear thing. Absolutely. Because, yeah. So it's Absolutely. worthless as an indicator for overfitting. All right, it's very important, right? And the importance is to this one. <coughs> so this dimension is equal to D, so D plus one D. So we need to choose <coughs> M much larger than D. So, so in this case, the conclusion is uh, the common sense. You need to use many more points in number of parameters. So the conclusion of this bound, in the case of linear classifiers, is that you need to use many more points than <coughs> number of parameters. Otherwise, the bound is very large. This term is very large. And you can select functions for empirical error, a function which doesn't work well on the test data. That's what the bound says. But it is a worst case bound. So could be that the function you select works well even if the number of points is smaller. Right? But this is what this bound says. There are other bounds we don't, don't discuss in the course, right, you, which apply to more large margin as pipes. That's we don't discuss it here in the course. But <coughs> Right. We will tell you that the number of points can be smaller than the number of dimensions. If you have a large margin, there is more bound. I don't know if this is what you ask, but this is not what we can discuss. And also, if the data is random, each dimension, the probability of having two points above each other is zero. Yes. So I'm asking that I like it. Yeah. It doesn't have to be two points. That's not important. Sorry. It doesn't have to be two points. It's a, like, yeah, an interesting case, in fact, yeah, <coughs> which you can apply this analysis is when the, the support to distribution is finite. Right? Then so we have only finitely many points. <coughs> so for example, you have images, binary images, right? Which picks up at the zero one. And you have a finite number of possible inputs that are important. They are two to the number of pixels, actually. Right? So they are huge number. Right? The same results apply there. <coughs> um, any questions? So I think we are almost yeah. Oh. Um, um, yeah, so the last thing I want to say, to go back to the bias bias, <coughs> the composition, and, um, all right, yeah. Um, so in all this discussion, we were abounding the difference between the two error of the library and the build on it, right? So this is not what these bounds were about. Right? So they were bounding the difference between this and that. The two error and the build on But what about the dif difference between the error of my algorithm right? and the uh, best error, right? what I call the base error, the error of the base as a but ultimately, this is what we want to address, right? So how far is the performance of the algorithm from the best possible performance? Okay. It turns out you can attack this question using these results that I've just described for their extension, this dimension. And the reason is the reason is uh, it's kind of Forward. It's just to add and subtract quantities and play some little algebra. So, so the reason is the important difficulty is what we have seen so far. Where we go now is just a matter of algebra. So this difference can be just be written as the bias plus the bias. Right? You just add and subtract this term. Right? 
So what is this term? This is the error of f h. So this is the error of, it's the best possible error in your class. Right? So this is the smallest error that you can obtain, uh, obtain in a function of the class. So this f h is the minimizer of the error in the class. Okay? And this you call the, the variance for some reason, we will see in a moment. So it's the difference between uh, the error of your algorithm minus the error of the best function in the class. This other term you call the bias, right? The difference between the error of the best function in the class and the base error. <coughs> and this is, is going to be positive, right? Because this is the smallest possible error. And this is something which should be uh, equal or larger. Okay. And um, now, the second term, we leave it there, but it is not a random variable, it's completely deterministic and is an uh, understanding of big T to the problem of approximation, of approximation theory. Right? And we leave it there. We don't discuss it. The first term, the variance, is a random variable because there is a sum of which of years, right? And we bound it using the analysis that we have seen so far. So how do we do it? Again, we add and subtract the empirical error. Right? So what we call the variance, we add and subtract this quantity. Okay? And then we observe that this is less or equal than this, where the only thing I have done is to replace this term by the empirical error of f h. This should be script h. And the reason for which this is true is that the empirical error of the algorithm is the smallest possible empirical error that I can obtain, because the algorithm could directly minimize the empirical error. Right? So if I replace that by the error of the best function in the class, so, right? so fh is the best function in the class according to the expected error. Right? So this is bigger than this. And that's why I have it. That's what you And now I have that the variance is less or equal than this term plus this term. And these two terms, I can bound them by my previous tool, right? Because I, before I derived a uniform bound, a bound which holds for the difference of every two, uh, difference between two and empirical error of every function in the class. Right? So, so this is less than <coughs> equal than two times that. So I do this with the same dimension. This is the same. That's why I get the factor of four as opposed to the factor of two that appear in the previous slide. So, um, so the conclusion is that uh, I have, uh, I can bound. So this is the absolute performance of my algorithm. Uh, sorry, the relative performance of my algorithm to the, the best I can do in the class. Right? For this quantity, which I call the variance, depends on the UC dimension of the class. So as the UC dimension increases, the variance increases. And this bound, which I haven't described, will have an, an opposite effect. So the larger the UC dimension, so the larger the complexity, the smaller this bound. Right? So, um, um, it just repeats what I've said. And it is instructive to do this uh, analysis in the case of the square error for regression, because in that case you um, you can work out the bias. Show that uh, the error, the true error, 
for a function is equal to the best error possible, so the error of the base function, plus the uh, average distance between fx and the base function. Yeah, so this is not difficult to see. You just here add and subtract the base uh, f star, right? <coughs> f star of x. And you use the fact that f star of x is uh, just Integral y times p of y given x. It's the conditional expectation. Expectation of. How do you say that? Yeah, <coughs> y given x. Yes. So, you obtain this result by just adding and subtracting here this quantity. <coughs> so, since the bias <coughs> is the difference between the best function in the class, right? so the best function in the class is the one which stays closest to the base function, uh, so it's the one which minimizes this term. Is the one which is closest on average, on average over the input distribution. <coughs> uh, so there is a way to also bound the bias. Right? So the bias is bound by the this dimension. The bias would be smaller and larger than function class, but you can also derive some approximation bounds. You can say if I have uh, the bound with the for what f star is. Now, to conclude, just a couple I think I don't have time, you can go back to what we said at the beginning, which was the average analysis algorithm, right? So, you can look at the average of your error, right? So, so you can take the average over the sample, right? And you can derive the classical bias and bias decomposition mentioned at the beginning. And uh, I will skip this part. If you do this, you see the link between the analysis that we described today and the classical analysis uh, done in statistics. So the bias will not change because you don't have to average. So that there is no random variable. The variance will be average of your bounds. So there will be a different quantity. So you go back to the issue that the distribution can have a heavy tail, but a small mean. So the, <coughs> the classical variance can be smaller than the one that we here. So this is just for your interest. I will not put in the exam. <laughs>